Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to worship service. Welcome to our Knox live stream worship service. My name is Richard Chong. I'm the minister at Knox United Church. I'd like to extend my special greetings and welcome to all of those who you are tuning in this morning to our live stream worship service for the first time. And that means everybody. That's everybody. Now, some of you have been watching our sermon cast and other news on a going basis, our virtual church family. And some of you are living near Knox in Vancouver, and some of you are living far away from here, physically, but close to us in spirit. Welcome. Greetings in the name of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And of course, welcome to our uh, Knox family, uh, wherever you are. I want to send my greetings in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and the friend in need. Know that we are not alone. So let me ask you first, how are you doing? What a crazy time we are in right now. It seems day by day things are, not, things are getting worse. It might get worse. People say it might get worse before it gets better. And we might be in some sort of enforced hibernation for a while. Social distancing is the norm of the days and weeks to come. I mean, it's a challenging time for all of us. But you see, at the same time, it's an opportunity for us to practice our Christian values as followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. It's an opportunity to reach out and love our neighbors. Of course, keeping our physical distance for now. It's time to be a church. We are called to be the church of Jesus Christ for such time as this. So it's an opportunity to connect with your loved ones near and far, your neighbors, call them up and talk to them how they're doing. And if there's anything you can do, and if you can, let other people know. I know at this point, the things are not as desperate but if the situation doesn't improve, it goes like longer than what it is, there will be people in desperate situation very soon. So we need to reach out and connect with these people now to prepare. We at Knox have prepared a number of ways to connect uh, with you through our virtual space uh, for you to reach us and to connect with us on an ongoing basis. We are updating our COVID-19 response on a regular basis, probably two times a week, from our board chair, Susan McAlphine. Uh, some of you probably have received her news and notes, and her audio recording is available on our church website front page. We have set up pastoral care plan tree ministry for Knox family, and our branch leaders have called most of Knox family through phones for pastoral care and other needs. You can find a section on the banner of our church website homepage. Just click and it will lead you to that page. Uh, and leave your, uh, if, you, if you want to be connected, even though if you are not a Knox family member, leave your contact number or email address. Uh, we will update you on an ongoing basis. Now today, I am worshiping at the church sanctuary and have one other person who is leading this worship service with me our church music director, Colleen Holter. Say hi, Colleen. Hi. You can't see her because she's far away from me. Not that she doesn't like me, but it's what we need to do at this point. But we are close in spirit. Now we have PowerPoint slide presentation for you to follow along with the worship service, with hymns and scripture text readings. So I encourage you to follow along. If you are sitting with, together with your family members, that would be great if you could do that. And then after the worship service, we want your feedback. If you see on the top of the page there's a button, message us. Click it, not now, later. Let us know how we can improve. And for other things, that, like prayer requests, ideas to share, let us know how you are doing, how you cope, and ideas to distance ourselves physically but intimate with one another through sharing of fun things you can do. Social distancing teaching us that we need more of each other, 
now more than ever. So we are hoping to upgrade our website so that it becomes hot for many of us to share and pray and connect. So once again, it's great to have you all join me and Pauline in this live stream worship service. We're here, you're here, and God is here. So let us worship. So we light this Christ candle, reminding ourselves that the light of Jesus Christ shines in the world. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. This light of Christ shines around us, in us, and in between us, and even in our virtual space. We also light this blue candle, candle of peace, hope, and healing for all those who are going through hardship from COVID-19 crisis. We want to remember them in our hearts and in our worship. May God's peace and healing be upon them. So the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us worship. Come, let us worship God. God is good. Let us enter God's gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. We enter God's courts with praise. This is the day that the Lord our God has made. We are glad and we rejoice in it. We rejoice and worship our God in good times and in bad times. We bless our God in good times and in bad times. We turn to God in times of crisis. Yes, we turn to God's amazing God is good. God is amazing. Let us sing amazing grace. Thank you. 
this Lenten season, our worship theme has been confession. In a gathering worship magazine, it says, Confession is countercultural. It is good for individuals and for our society because in it, we acknowledge to each other the messiness of our lives, the challenges, and the grief. Confession is not about making ourselves look good, but allowing ourselves to be real. So we come to God as we are this morning, broken, messy, and in deep need of God's mercy. So in humility, let us confess to God in silence. God is good. God's grace in Jesus Christ washes all our sins. We are forgiven. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. So we will sing Psalm 91.
So today's scripture reading is from John chapter 9, verses 1 to 41. And it's the story uh, of a man who was born blind and he was healed by Jesus. Jesus healed his eyes. And then he goes on to uh, meet other people, especially religious leaders, and he encounters quite a bit of a confusing uh, sort of encounter with some of the religious leaders. And that's what the story is all about. It's a long narrative. Now, but I like to listen from the beginning to end. And it's a dramatic reading from one of our Knox Church members. And as you listen, I'd like you to notice what feelings go through your mind. This is a reading of John 9, verses 1 to 41. One day as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. Then the man went and washed, and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No. But it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? The man replied, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. Where is he? I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him, How did you receive your sight? He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight, and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. The man said, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I had told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciples but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. 
The man replied, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The Pharisee said, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. And the man replied, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And then Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus replied, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. So what feelings went through your mind as you listened to the interactions between the man born blind by his eyes was opened by Jesus and the religious leaders? If you were, do some interaction. If you have some family members together, just give you about 10 seconds to some interaction, what went through your mind. Now, if you were the blind person, what feelings probably went, uh, went through your mind as you were interacting? Frustrations? Unbelief? What? Intimidation? Shock? Confusion? Now, if you were one of religious leaders, what feelings have gone through your mind as you were interacting with this blind person? Pleasure? Indignation? Justice? Sense of zeal? So, who won the argument? Well, we can talk about that later and you can actually talk amongst yourself. So, how do you respond to people like these religious leaders? Hello, open your eyes, can't you see? For example, how do you respond to people like this? Now we all know that our earth is like several billion years old, give or take a few million years here and there, but it's an old earth, okay? so we all know that. But there are people, significant number of people, who believe that the earth is only several thousand years old. I don't know what universe they're from, or what information they are getting their facts from, but that's what they firmly believe. So, what is the best answer or best response to someone who says the earth is only 7,000 years old? Well. Here's the answer in exact order. You follow this. Walk away, fill up cattle with water, heat the cattle to a boil, get a mud, add tea bag to the mud, add boiling water to mud, leave to brew for a few minutes, remove tea bag, add milk, and enjoy your lovely cup of tea. That's the only course of action which will lead to your satisfaction. I mean, there's no logical argument which can sway someone who truly believes this young earth nonsense. I mean, you could give them a full history of where the myth comes from, that you should not read certain Bible sections literally, like the early chapters in the book of Genesis, especially the creation account. It would show them the false of evidence, or it show them the cosmolo cosmological evidence, but do you really think that will convince them? No. 
All you can do is leave them alone. And the best course of action is to go make yourself a nice cup of tea. They're happy, and you're happy, and it's not worth butting your head against that particular brick wall. So what would have been the best course of action if you were blind then to those Pharisees who says, you're alive, you didn't open your eyes. Well, walk away. And the cavalry walked. So the Pharisees did not believe that the man who was born blind had his eyes open and that Jesus opened his eyes. Why didn't they believe? Why did they even try to persecute the man for telling the truth? I mean, the evidence was plain clear, and the blind man testifies, I am he, I was born blind, and he, Jesus, over there, he is the one who actually opened my eyes. And even his parents said, yes, it is our son, the blind from birth, and his eyes opened. Why didn't they believe? Well, because they made up their mind already about Jesus, about religious law regarding Sabbath, about their position, about, and about this man. As far as they were concerned, Jesus was a troublemaker, threat to their religious establishment, a rebel, and a lawbreaker whom they wanted to get rid of. And as far as they were concerned, there's no way a sinner like Jesus would ever perform a miracle like healing a blind person, only a prophet. Like Elijah would do such feet, not this hippie, kind of grungy looking, wandering teacher. They made up their mind already, and they stuck with it. And they were interested, all they were interested was to find a reason to discredit and get rid of him. So they said, why did you heal on a Sabbath day? But do you see the irony in that if they persecute Jesus for healing on a Sabbath day, that meant that they were admitting that he healed, which they didn't want to admit, so they were in a double jeopardy. They made up their mind already that they would embrace information that supports their beliefs and reject information that contradicts them. And as far as they were concerned, this blind man absolutely contradicted what they believed to be true. For them, the facts and the reasons didn't matter, didn't persuade them at all. For them, their bias was their reality, not the reality itself. Now, we are often stuck in our bias about ourselves, about others, about the world around us, about God, about many, many things. And our bias can blind us to see our reality. Our bias can color the reality. Often we tend to perceive the reality more from our bias than reality itself. Now I'm not saying that all our bias is bad or dangerous. I have certain bias towards certain things and it's okay, like I happen to believe that Starbucks coffee is much better than Tim Hortons. But some of you might have different opinions about that. You believe the other way. I think you're wrong. I think you should change your mind, but that's just my opinion, my bias, which I think is right. But if it makes you happy, I'm okay with that. No, I'm not. I can live with that. You're happy and I'm happy. I mean, we all have opinions and bias about many things, and it's okay. If you think you're handsome and awesome, that's okay. Others might not share your beliefs and bias, they don't see it that way, but you do, as long as it makes you happy or well, bless your heart. I have four brothers. My oldest brother thinks he is the most handsome guy ever. We, other brothers, don't see it that way, and we tell him that. We tell him that you need to get a life. Have you looked at yourself in the mirror lately? But he keeps insisting he is handsome and dashing and all that. I just don't understand what he sees in the mirror. But as long as he is happy, I guess it's okay to be stuck in that personal paradise of bias. Bless his heart. It doesn't harm anyone. Annoying, but not harming anybody. So we all have certain convictions and beliefs and opinions and bias about many things, and most of them we can tolerate. 
maybe not knowing, but we can live with that. But there are certain convictions and beliefs and bias and that are deadly. There are lines we need to draw from tolerance to dangerous bias and beliefs because if you were to act on your bias, that deadly bias, it can get us into a lot of trouble. What's the best answer to those who say that the global warming and the global climate change is not happening? Well, you walk away. You can walk away. It requires more than just walking away, just ignoring it, because consequences can be deadly if people act on these distorted beliefs and bias. Now, I don't want to go into de every detail about global climate crisis we are in, we are facing right now, because I mean we are facing a pandemic crisis that we haven't experienced before in most of our lifetime, and which we need to deal with it right now. But just to say that over 95% of climate scientists around the globe say that we are in a deep, deep trouble, and we need to stop it right now, or yesterday. It's accelerating. I mean, you, we, you all know this. You all know that. And we are worried about that. It's not just for our own well-being that we need to do something about this, but for our children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, our next generations will inherit this mess. We can't ignore anymore and just walk away because our humanity's well-being is at risk. Why would people stick to their distorted beliefs and bias to the extent of being deadly? I don't know. Maybe they get kicked out of being outliers. But deadly outliers. Maybe they get kicked out of being maverick. As a matter of fact, the research suggests that people experience genuine pleasure, a rush, or dopamine when processing information that supports their beliefs and bias, even, even the distorted ones. It feels good to stick to our guns even if we are wrong, they observe. Like those religious leaders who stuck with their bias, who tried to shut down this man whose eyes were off, open. And ultimately, they were successful in conspiring to shut down the one who came to heal us, to save us. Their bias blinded them blinded to recognize the Messiah in their mess. They couldn't see even with their eyes open because they were blinded inside. Now, we're facing, we are in a crisis situation that most of us have never faced before. Our parents and grandparents have gone through World War I and II and endured hardships for many years, but most of us grew up, thanks to many brave and loving people, that, that we have never had to experience war in our lifetime. But this COVID-19 crisis, our war, that all of us, that all humanity is facing right now, regardless of where you are. And it's going to test us, like the World War I and II and other wars have tested people and the neighbors and community and the nations. And this COVID-19 crisis will and is testing us, our character, our commitment, our faithfulness to one another, our faithfulness to our neighbors, and to our faithfulness to all humanity and our faithfulness to God. We are in the midst of Lent, a season of testing and refining us, individually and collectively as church and the community and a nation. How should we respond as Church of Jesus Christ, as people of God, as responsible and caring and loving neighbors? There are two responses, basically. One is based on fear. It's all about you, focusing on self, survival of the fittest or richest or healthy ones. Each person to him or herself, holding and keeping it, ignoring this sort of kind of bumper mentality. And I'm sure uh, all those who have purchased this end time survival bunkers would feel very secure right now. You go inside your bunker and with years of food stored there already and you stay away from civilization. I could just hear them say, I told you so. But it's fear-based. It's self-centered. 
That is one option. Maybe some of you are thinking about that already. I've heard that in the USA, gun purchasing is increasing in many folds. These are all based on fears, self-centered. It's about I, it's about me, it's about mine, it's about my it's Whatever you hear, you are looking out for yourself. It's deep bias. It's based on the fear, and your fear is your reality. Now, option number two, be the church. We might need to distance ourselves physically, but we can still reach out and touch our neighbors with the phone calls, and if they need something, and if we can help let other people in our network to know, we need to be the ones who need to look out for our fellow human beings in times like this. This is a time to be the church of Jesus Christ. We need to open our eyes and see the reality and how we can be the church. We are called to heal in times such as this. That's what early church did. In the midst of persecution, in crisis, for many years, they connected intimately one another and with God. They met underground in catacombs to celebrate the Lord's Supper. I guess our 21st century underground would be like our virtual worship space like this. I said last, last week, last Sunday, as I was finishing my uh, sermon, this coronavirus, uh, the pandemic virus like no other, but like any other flu virus, this virus is indiscriminate, indiscriminate in infecting people and making people sick, regardless of who you are. It crosses every line, every gender, every culture, every race, every age. It crosses all barriers, indiscriminate in infecting people and making people sick. No border line too big or too tall to cross. What we are called to be and to do is to become a virus of good news of Jesus Christ. To cross every border and barrier to bring healing, to bring hope, and to bring reconciliation and peace to all for those broken and suffering people. So let Jesus open your eyes to see that reality. And Jesus is calling us and saying, can you see, can you see me now? Can you see the reality? Can you be the church in times like this? Now, you probably uh, received a uh, up, uh, regular update from our uh, board chair, uh, Susan McAlpine, and in, in that update, uh, this is what she has uh, written, and this is what she has said uh, about our offering. She said, without our regular renters and special events, docs will experience a drop in income. Even in this exceptional time, we have expenses to meet, salaries and hydro, phone bills and repairs, name a few. We ask you to keep up with your giving. Three ways you can do as you do. Mail your offering check to Knox or drop off the church office mail slot. And also there's a link on this website on top of the left corner it says donate button. Just click and make a donation for ongoing Knox ministries. And for all others who are visitors and guests for the first time, and for those of you who have been watching in the past, maybe the best way is for you to extend your generosity to those around you, to support your local church, and to charities of your choice. And if you still wish to donate to Knox Ministry, we will be very appreciative of your support. So let us pray. God, we give you thanks that you have blessed us richly. We offer a token of what you have blessed us. Use them for your ministry in the world. Amen.
So our pastoral care phone ministry team has been busy since last week Wednesday calling our Knox family to check in for any concerns and prayer requests. We are collecting your prayer requests and will pray for them. And also call for any pastoral care need, need that you have. So I encourage you to message us for prayer requests or pastoral prayer requests or someone from your pastoral care team may call you. I especially want to invite all those who are worshiping together with us from far away locations that if you have any prayer concerns for your family, your friends, or church members, and your community at large, please let us know. And we can mention them as well. I believe this is time for all of us, wherever we are, to support one another through prayers. And knowing that we are being supported by other brothers and sisters in Christ from many different places will truly encourage us and connect us as one in Christ Jesus. So I want to hold you up today in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. O Holy One, we give you thanks that you are good and faithful to us always. We come together as your people under the wings of your loving arms to pray for one another and to offer our concerns and our gratitudes in times like this. We pray for many who are suffering from COVID-19 crisis, those who are infected, who are suffering, who are recovering in the hospital and in the homes, and those who are affected indirectly, many people who have lost their jobs, their employment, their business, and the brink of financial crisis. Many of those who are stranded in faraway places from home, many who are isolated in their own homes, and all of us who are overwhelmed and in desperate situation. Lord, we pray for you to come and save us, heal us, strengthen us, restore us, Lord, in your mercy. But in the midst of crisis, we also give thanks and pray for many, many good people who are trying hard to help others in this crisis situation. The government workers, health workers, police, doctors, and nurses, and many who are offering their time and treasure to fight the virus to help one another. We lift them up to you. We also pray for one another. Help us to stop the spread. Fill us with a sense of civic responsibility in times like this. To help one another. To cooperate and support the ways to stop the virus and the spread social distancing, but help us to connect each other more than ever before. We especially pray for all those who are vulnerable to the virus, the seniors, sick people, the young ones. Lord, protect them, Lord. We pray for our country. Pray for other countries too, like the United States, Italy, Iran, Spain, and Europe. Lord, slow the spread. Inspire the leaders of the world to come together for the common good, for the common cause, for the common well-being for all humanity. We pray. We also lift up our loved ones, Lord, near and far. And we call out their names, knowing that you listen to our cry. So we gather together with one voice, one mind, one spirit. We pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, and on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we will sing, Open My Eyes,
So be good to yourself and reach out to your loved ones through phones and through emails. Keep the social distance for now, but keep Jesus close to your hearts always. And in this week, ask yourself, as you are sort of hibernating in your homes, each and every day ask yourself, what am I grateful for today? What am I grateful for today? And list that, because we are God's people and we are to give thanks always in good times and bad times. And send what you are grateful for by clicking message us and we will share your thanks next Sunday. God is good and faithful. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.